Good evening and welcome to AP Statistics Office Hours with Darren Starnes. My name is Curtis Brown. I'll be your host this evening. I'm really excited about this evening, Darren. We've got some... Uh uh, some really great stuff lined up. My favorite uh, time in the course, as probably many uh, stats teachers, this is uh, this is kind of the the uh, accumulation of of all the things we've been doing all fall and trying to get things lined up, ready for inference. And I'm really excited that we uh, we get to start that tonight. Yeah, I'm uh, glad to be back with you, Curtis. This is one of my favorite sections also because I think it lays the foundation for the whole rest of the course. And with this year. Uh, being so challenging on scheduling for teachers, it might even give a little opportunity for us to talk about how to streamline pacing from here to the end of the year. So right. if we have a little time at the end, maybe we can uh, talk about how this particular session might help teachers and their students get done with the uh, course a little bit quicker. Yeah, I think that'll be a really nice uh, nice little way to cap the, the evening off um, and kind of get things going. So um, let's go ahead and, and get started. Sounds good. I uh, see my screen okay? Yeah, I can see it. It looks great. Excellent. So uh, our plan for tonight is to show you uh, how the TI-8384 and the TI-INSPIRE can be used to help support uh, the teaching and learning of units six and eight of the AP Statistics CED. Uh, for those of you who haven't gotten all of those units in your mind yet, unit six is inference for categorical data proportions and unit eight is inference for categorical data chi-square but we saw some opportunities along the way to connect back to prior units uh, so you're going to see a little bit uh, from unit three on collecting data both random sampling and randomized experiments and you're going to see some treatment in unit five on sampling distributions I think a lot of us know that that unit is one of the most difficult for students, uh, but one of the most important to build on when you get to inference. Uh, we're going to share a couple of real world examples along the way uh, that tie these things together. And as always, we would be glad to answer your questions. So if something comes up along the way, please just uh, type a question for us in the chat and uh, that'll be monitored and we'll try to answer it as, uh, as we can. Yeah, I think that's really important. As you guys are are uh, putting things up or thinking about what we're talking about here, please, please put your questions in the in the chat so we can respond to them. All right. So here's our first scenario. Um, this is about distracted driving, which is kind of the theme of tonight's session. So the National Youth Risk Behavior Survey does an annual <clears throat> evaluation of. Uh, risky things that teens do. And the most recent one from 2019 revealed that 39% of the teens uh, who are drivers reported texting or emailing while driving in the past 30 days. So that's what the teens said they do. Keep that in mind. Uh, a South Carolina researcher uh, suspects that the percentage is even higher in his state. This hypothetical researcher might be me since I'm living in South Carolina now. Uh, so he surveys a random sample of 300 South Carolina teen drivers, and of those, 135 say that they text or email while driving, uh, have done so in the past 30 days. So the first question we're going to be tackling is, do the data provide convincing evidence to support the researcher's suspicion? Remember, the suspicion is that the percentage is higher here in terms of distracted driving in South Carolina. And I want to note that the sample result of 135 out of 300 who said that they do text or email while driving uh, or did so in the past 30 days uh, is 0.45. So that is greater than the national value of 0.39. So there is some evidence from the sample to support the researcher's suspicion. But it's also possible that the truth in South Carolina is 39% and maybe just by random sampling, uh, the random sample produced 45% who said yes. At least that's the idea we're gonna explore. And after Curtis is done uh, exploring things, then we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to calculate and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion and address how that relates to the test that we're gonna do in part A. 
So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Curtis, who's going to do a nifty simulation uh, on the TI Inspire. All right. Well, I'm ready when you are, uh, Darren. Coming your way. All right. Fantastic. So one of, uh, can you see my screen okay there, Darren? Yep. All right. So one of my uh, favorite times uh, in the course is definitely this idea of, of random sampling and then and then being able to talk about sampling distributions and and how do these things actually uh, occur? Um, and I'm on I'm on the TI Inspire CX2, um, but everything that I'm going to do here this evening, actually I'm on a CX2 cast. Everything that I'm going to do this evening uh, and show you could certainly be done on a on a TI Inspire. Um, or a TI Inspire CX in any uh, version of these had has this uh, set of capabilities. And so um, this is something you can explore as well. So one of the things we would like to do is simulate uh, random samples. So that, that sample of 45% uh, that this researcher collected um, does lead us to some sort of, of suspicion, uh, maybe, okay, well, there's some evidence, um, but is it possible that that could have happened uh, at random or how likely maybe is the better question. Could that have happened um, by just circumstance of, of random sampling? Um, and then that that's possible. So let's let's look and see how we did this. Okay, um, on the on the left in column A, I have uh, our drivers, and really this is a representative population of drivers with 39% of them. Um, being DIS or distracted. Um, that's how I've abbreviated there. I could have typed it all the way out, but my fingers got tired and I just didn't want to type that much. Um, really, no, I, I, you know, display um, just kind of gets in the way there. But one thing I want to point out is it's important. I, I typed these in as, um, as strings. So I use the quotations around this. That's going to be important later on um, while I'm defining this as a categorical variable. Um, and as I go through here, you'll note I've got uh, I've got exactly 100. Well, you can't actually see that, but I've got exactly 100 uh, values in here. Um, 39 of them being DIS, um, and the remaining 61 being not DIS. All right. And so we're going to use that as a population to sample from um, without replacement, or sorry, with replacement. We're gonna we're gonna dump things back in and draw again from this from this sample over and over again. Um, I'll come back to this, this stuff that's over here on the left hand or on the right hand side of my screen here in just a second. But the first thing I want to do is I want to define my sample. I'm going to uh, navigate to a, a new page here and I've inserted a, a notes page and you guys can see that I've already kind of built this uh, built this out just a little bit, but I want to show you how uh, a simulation like this could be built. Um, and so I've got a notes page that I'm going to use a math box um, to create a, a sample um, using a command called random sample. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull up rand samp and I'm just typing this in here. Um, it is available to you underneath of uh, the math menu and statistics. You can pull it from the catalog. There's a number of ways that you can pull this up. I just typed it up. It's not too hard to type in rand samp. And then I want to sample, my sample that I want to be sampling from is from that, that population that I had um, called drivers. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull up um, that list called drivers. That's my list that I'm going to draw from, my population. And this, uh, this South Carolina researcher took 300 uh, students, so sampled 300 students from that population. And I'm going to uh, do these without replacement or with replacement rather so that I have that, I maintain that 39% uh, in my large population. Of course, we know that when we're sampling in real life, we, we're not uh, replacing those people, putting them back in, but the population is so large that uh, that 39% that um, holds pretty well true. Um, through that sampling uh, possibility. So when I hit return, when I hit enter on this, what I'm going to return, what I'm going to receive is a really long list. I won't scroll through the entire thing, but that, that green list is a random sample drawing from that, that uh, list drivers 
at random and putting those values into a list of now it's 300 long. And so you can see on the right hand side over here, I have that uh, those proportions. I have 110 cases uh, of people being distracted and uh, 190 cases of, of people not being distracted um, or at least admitting that they are not distracted or that they have not done this, this distracting thing while they are while they're driving. All right, and now we're gonna look at coming up with the sample proportion because that's uh, uh, of particular interest to us. We actually wanna know um, how, how much or what the proportion of people is. Now I could do that pretty quickly over here, 110 over 190, right? We could do that, um, but we are sorry, 110 over uh, 300. I don't wanna do that just every single time myself and then type in the numbers. I wanna automate this because part of the thing is I wanna do this a whole bunch of times. because that's what simulation is all about, right? Is doing this repeated sampling uh, piece here. So we're going to um, build the sample proportion for multiple times over. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a command called count if. And it's located, I, I did go and, and find this for you. I'll, I'll, I'll show you where it is in the catalog. It's underneath of, um, when you open up the catalog, underneath of your list uh, choices, it's underneath of list, and then it's filed underneath of logic. And that makes some sense, right? Count if, that's a logic statement. Um, and we're going to count if um, some list value is equal to some criteria that we're gonna set up. And I'll show you how this criteria can be can be worked out. You guys can read a little bit more carefully if you want to um, how it actually is is worked out and all the different vari variants that you could do. But um, we're going to do count if, and we're interested in is my sample a distract is the is a particular value um, in my sample a distracted person? We want to count the number of distracted people, and so we're going to use this little uh, dummy variable, the question mark there um, and we're going to type in equal um, so the question mark is is it equal to and now i again i have to use that uh set of quotations dis make sure that i'm i'm looking at is it the string dis um, and then i'm going to put it over the 300 that i know i sampled there are ways that you could do this where maybe you're changing sample size and you want to demonstrate other things. So you might want to use a, a way to determine what the sample size was. In this case, I'm doing 300 every time, so I don't really, I don't really care uh, about having to make that automated. So I'm going to type in the 300 and I'll press enter. And lo and behold, uh, I'm pretty sure that if I took 110 and divided by 300, I should get 0.36666. Um, as my resultant uh, proportion, right? So I've done that one time, which is really great. And in fact, on my next page, I even went ahead and put a graph here. Now I had one data point already, so now I've got two. Uh, I've done it. I've done it twice. Now there's a little bit of magic happening here in the background um, because you guys have seen how we how we built this. Now the the uh, the really interesting part is how did we get that captured? Well, I've got another list and spreadsheet page. I could have done this on the first page but, and hit it back there in the corners, but I wanted to show it to you uh, out front. And that is um, this sampling distribution um, list that I'm going to build. I've set it equal to, and there's a capture command. So I'm going to capture the value in my variable sampling proportion, sample proportion, um, Every single time, that's what the one is showing me. Every, every time that that value changes, it will automatically insert the next, uh, insert it into, or augment the list, if you wanna call it that, augment this list with the new variable or with the new value, all right? So we're kind of, uh, kind of working through uh, that each time. Now, Darren, I, I didn't uh, talk about this uh, at first, but maybe I should have. This list called SAMP that I've just kind of pulled here is all 300 individuals that I've sampled um, from the population. And so you can see that this is, I mean, I'm just scrolling through and this is all of my pieces and it grows all the way down to 300, uh, 300 people. I don't have to prove that to you, but that's, 
That's what that is. All right. So I'm going to repeat this a couple of times. In fact, I'm going to repeat it. Whoops. I'm going to repeat this. Oh, I don't know. A whole bunch of times uh, over. All right. So we want to we want to do this uh, random sample a whole bunch of times over. Um, and I'm just going to keep doing it. And you'll notice on the right hand side, I'm getting each individual random sample. I'm getting a picture of that uh, each time. Is that making some sense? You're seeing what I'm what I'm seeing there. Um, What's I'm happening over on that dot thing. plot? Say that again. What's happening over on that dot plot? Is anything happening over there? Ah, this is a good question. So now I've done this a whole bunch oh. of times, and look at that. I'm filling in my dot plot. I've got a nice little mound here. Uh, that I've got going on here. And I, I could build this where I've got all three on one page, but I really like my picture uh, of having this, this, uh, this dot plot sort of showing on the screen. And we could keep doing this. In fact, I think we need to do it a few more times actually, Darren. Um, I am noticing one thing that I wish I would have done and that is um, I should, uh, should uh, do these guys in their display. I need them to display uh, Want them to display alphabetically so it won't keep jumping around on us but that's all right we'll i'll fix that in a minute so i'm going to do a few more here now kids you know kids will sit here and they'll do this for the rest of class they like watching the picture change and they like watching this so it is important maybe that we get it that we get a move on but i wanted a decent uh a decent distribution for us to look at okay so now we got this this nice little mound here it's kind of interestingly shaped um we've we notice that we're kind of getting something centered around that 39%, uh, which makes some sense, right? Since we're sampling with replacement, we're dumping everything back in and each time. So we should expect to be varying on either side of 39% pretty, pretty much uh, at random. So now the question, what happened to that 40, uh, 45%? Um, that we were interested in. So I've, I've, I've got a value here. I've called it um, P hat, which um, that was our original uh, sample. And down here below, I've got a probability value, called it P value um, here. And what I'm calculating here is the number of times that that sampling distribution, that the value in that sample proportion uh, exceeded or was equal to uh, that 45%. So, and I'm gonna divide that by the total number uh, of samples that I've taken. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow this up just a little bit. I, I had this built so it was nice and pretty. So when you guys ask me for the TNS file, which totally you guys can ask me for this TNS file and I've got it already pre-built and I'll email it to you. That's, that's not a problem at all. I, I would be very happy to share this simulation with you. Um, but I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna actually break these two guys uh, apart here. Um, I'm going to, to split them out so that you guys can see this notes page um, at a little bit more, uh, a little bit better uh, screen size. So we're not squinting our eyes to try to see what I was doing there. So in this case, what I've done is I've counted the number of times that that sampling distribution value, so that sample proportion uh, that comes up in that list called sampling distribution. I wanna know the number of times that that is uh, greater than or equal to the value that I've labeled p hat, that, that 45%. And I'm going to count, I'm gonna divide that by the total length of that sampling distribution. In other words, if I'd only done it once and I had zero, I would only, I would have zero divided by one and I'd get zero, right? And that's why I wanted to do this a whole bunch of times. So I got a nice distribution uh, of, of values. Um, and I, I got a pretty reasonable approximation, a pretty good idea of what the probability of exceeding or being equal to or exceeding this, uh, this proportion, the sample proportion, that original sample proportion of 45%. All right, so that's kind of the way that you can build this. And this, this is one of the really neat things about using TI Inspire 
um, in your in your stats classes is that you do have this ability to build these kinds of simulations. And this is one that I would think, Darren, um, you can give me your opinion on this, but I would think this is one that students could build um, based on the the prompt that we that we were able to give. I think so. Uh, and what's really nice is that you can get a, a good sense of how likely or unlikely a sample result like 45% or more would be just from the simulation. So everything I do after this is just going to seem like gravy. Right, right. I mean, it's, it's going to be confirmation of, of this, this idea of being roughly uh, somewhere in that 10, uh, one to one and a half percent uh, range. All right, so I'm going to let you kind of take us, take us from here and then uh, we'll see what, see what comes next. Sounds great. Can you see my screen okay there, Curtis? Uh, let me stop first. Here. Oh, okay. There you go. All right, you should be good. And can you see me? Yep, good. you're good to go. All right, so uh, this is a quick recap. Uh, these are some of the screenshots that you saw Curtis going through on the Inspire, building up that simulated sampling distribution, looking for that 0.45 or even more surprising if the truth here in South Carolina were 39%. And the p-value that Curtis got today was somewhere around 0 0.017. Uh, right. So what I'd like to do now is take you through what we would do if we were carrying out this problem in unit six. What Curtis took you through is how you might approach the same problem in unit five, sampling distributions. But in unit six, we build a lot more formal technique for setting up a significance test. The key ideas behind the significance test, Curtis just did them. Uh, so everything else is just formalizing that. So in unit six, we would want students to be able to state hypotheses. So the null hypothesis here would be that the true proportion of South Carolina drivers who would say that they've texted or emailed while driving is the same as that national percentage of 39%. The alternative that the researcher suspected is that the South Carolina proportion is actually greater than that reported number from the nation. Uh, that for some reason, South Carolina drivers are more likely to be engaging in distracted driving. Maybe based on his own experience driving around here in South Carolina, say. <laughs> um, and we expect the students to be able to define that parameter uh, so that we know what they're referring to, that it really is the proportion of all South Carolina teen drivers who would say that they've texted or emailed while driving in the past 30 days. Not to be confused with the proportion who did. We would need some sort of camera or other monitoring technology to figure that out, uh, but this is just the percentage that said uh, they did those things. And that, um, Darren, that's one thing that does come up often, right, in, in free response um, answers on the exam is this, this idea of being explicit about the population or the, the result that you're talking about and, and being able to apply this. So I think that's, that's really important that it's the, those who would report mm -hmm. texting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to go ahead and state a, since no significance level was given, I'm going to use 0.05 as my cutoff or something that's really surprising or not. Uh, we would expect students in unit six to know that the right procedure uh, to use is a one sample Z test for a population proportion. And then they would need to check the conditions for using that procedure. Now this is gonna be important on our second example. So, mm. I mean, things are gonna work out real nicely right now, but I'm giving you a little spoiler alert uh, the next example, things are, are not going to go so well for me. They'll go fine for Curtis, but not, not so well on my end. Uh, so we need random data production. Otherwise, we can't uh, make an inference, in this case, to the larger population. So fortunately, we have a random sample of 300 South Carolina teen drivers. That'll allow us to generalize to the population of all South Carolina teen drivers. We also need to check, since we are sampling without replacement, Curtis was mentioning the population needs to be quite large for that to, uh, to be acceptable because we just kept using the 0.39 value as you saw, and that's what we do in the calculations here also. Uh, so we're definitely sure that there are more than 3,000 South Carolina teen drivers. Uh, no more than 10% of the population is sort of a good general rule when you're sampling without replacement. And the other thing is that that simulated sampling distribution that Curtis was building 
we need it to come out approximately normal looking in order to do this one sample Z test for a proportion. Curtis doesn't need that at all. Like mm -hmm. the simulation, it didn't matter how that came out looking, he could count dots at or to the right of that line and cal calculate a simulated p-value. So again, another spoiler alert for the next example uh, when things go badly for me. So we're okay here, 3000 times the 0.39, that's the null value gives us 1170 and n times one minus p naught is uh, 1830. Those are both at least 10. So we can use the approximately normal distribution for our calculations. Really important that students know not only what conditions they're checking, but why. Uh, for sure, the AP exam likes to interrogate them on why they're doing these different conditions. Uh, that so that one, that one there is a is a really important one. I know my students. Uh, that was one that we we kind of went back and forth a lot about this idea of large counts and why are we really talking about this this idea of of large counts and what does that matter? I think that's a really important one to hit. Mm -hmm. And the the punchline is if Kurt, Curtis had kept on going and hitting enter the whole rest of the session and gotten a really really big dot plot, it would have come out approximately normal looking. It would have come out very nicely normal yeah. looking. Yeah. And this, mm -hmm. this is our way of checking that. So for doing the calculation, remember our sample proportion 135 out of 300 was 0.45. Here is that standardized test statistic. We compare the 0.45 that we got in the sample to the 0.39, that's the null hypothesis value. And we divide by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And since we believe 0.39, for now is the truth in South Carolina. That's the number we use in the denominator for calculating the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So it's the square root of P times one minus P over N. Z score of 2.13. And now, depending on how old school or new school you are, you could use technology quite nicely to, uh, to get the P value, or you could give your kids uh, one of those tables like table A of standard normal probabilities and look it up there. Um, I sort of decided I'd go like TI 8384, since that's kind of the point of tonight's talk. And I went to the, um, the stat tests menu and ran things through that way. Uh, so let me just go there now. If I go to stat tests and run my one proportion Z test, you can see I've entered my null value of 0.39. My number of successes in my sample 135. That's got to be a whole number. The calculator gets angry. And the sample size of 300. I need to change this uh, alternative hypothesis value because I was really only interested in whether uh, the true proportion in South Carolina was higher than the national proportion. I thought it was higher. And then I can come down to either calculate or draw either of those. Uh, if I draw, I'm going to get a nice picture of it. So that's pretty appealing. Mm hmm. Ah, um, looks nice. I've got a very nice you P value have... there that looks really yeah. close to what Curtis got by simulation, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, I stopped at a pretty nice spot. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see uh, the probability value according to the one proportion Z test is about 0.017. Well, that's... Same as we got by a simulation. That was, uh, that was fortunate there. Yeah. <laughs> and the final part of our test is to draw the conclusion. So because the P value uh, 0.0166 or so is less than that 0.05 alpha level that I set. We reject the null hypothesis. So the data do provide convincing evidence that the proportion of South Carolina teen drivers who would report texting or emailing while driving in the past 30 days is greater than 39%. So we have convincing evidence. We sure do. That's a, that was a really nice uh, example. I, I enjoy that the, that the simulation comes out so beautifully right next to uh, right next to the, the inference uh, the inferential procedure the former the formal procedure and there, there was a bit a little bit of a follow-up because I, I saw how the test came out I thought well I wonder if we could estimate the true proportion of South Carolina teen drivers mm. who would say that they texted or emailed while driving we, we've concluded we think it's greater than 39 percent but how much greater are we talking so I decided to calculate and interpret a 90% confidence interval. So just a word about why 90%. I was using an alpha level of 5% on one tail. In order to get a confidence interval, that's going to be something in the middle of a distribution. So that leaves out two tails. So if I want 
5% on one tail, that means I'm going to have to have 5% on the other tail to leave the 90% in the middle for the confidence interval. So as long as the confidence uh, level 90% matches up with the 5% and the 5% to total 100, then I've picked the right confidence level. And you can see that the confidence interval down here, 0.403 to 0.497, now you've got some indicator of how much more than 39% uh, of the South Carolina teen drivers would say that they've been doing these things over the past 30 days, somewhere between like 40.3% and 49.7%. Um, notice that half or more is not a believable value for the population proportion, but anything between say 40 0.3 and 49.7%, any of those would be believable. And 39% ain't, ain't in there. So 39% is not believable. Which right. Is what we did by the test. Yeah. That's a great way to, to look at that. Maybe even some confirmation as to what we've what we've just done. And this this idea of um, looking at the alpha level and comparing that to my uh, confidence level here. Um that alpha value that I had um, from before, it, that's a big one. That's a big one. And, and, and that's another one that, that AP does enjoy um, putting out there, especially in the multiple choice. So there's my concluding statement, just so I'm clear on what I said verbally. Uh, that's the interpretation of that confidence interval. And there's my statement again, that 39% isn't plausible because that's, not in that interval right over there. Neither is 50%, but all those values between 40.3 and 49.7% would be plausible. Okay, well, you've seen the first example, but the second one we definitely wanna to get to because this is where the technology is in some ways superior to the traditional unit six methods. So this is one of my favorite um, studies about distracted driving. It was done several years ago, and it was the basis of an AP exam free response question shortly thereafter. Uh, however, when they wrote the AP exam free response question, they changed the original data from the study so that the conclusion of the AP exam free response problem would be the conclusion they wanted. I didn't like that. So I went and got the original study and gave, gave you tonight the original data. So this was about uh, which is more distracting, uh, talking on a cell phone while you're driving or talking to a passenger. This was in the early days of having cell phone use in vehicles uh, and states were starting to decide whether to implement laws to make that not okay. Uh, well, they have a nice driving simulator at the University of Utah and David Strayer and some of his colleagues set up an experiment to try to investigate. And they had some uh, volunteer undergraduate students to serve as their, uh, their subjects, uh, maybe from a psychology class or something. And uh, Strayer and colleagues randomly assigned half of the subjects to drive in their simulator while talking on a cell phone and the other half to drive in the simulator while talking to a passenger sitting with them in the simulator. Now it's important to note that uh, whether they were on the cell phone or uh, with the passenger in the simulator, the people talking to them were not allowed to discuss anything about their driving. That's important because of the re response variable that was measured. Uh, in this case, it was whether the person driving in the simulator rem remembered to stop at the rest area they were told to by the researchers before they started. Oh. That was one of the things that they measured. So you don't want the person uh, talking to the passenger reminding them of that, or that'll mess up the, the, uh, the collection of the data. So what happened? Well, in the group that was talking to the passenger in the simulator, 21 of them out of the 24 remembered to stop, three of them did not. In the group talking on the cell phone, half of them remembered to stop and the other half did not. And you probably know where I'm going with this. Um, is there some evidence that talking on a cell phone or talk, talking to a passenger, that one of those is more distracting than the other? Well, yes. Uh, the, the passenger group, 21 out of the 24, stopped at the rest area like they were supposed to. Whereas in the cell phone group, it was only 12 out of 24, only half. So there's definitely some evidence that in this case, talking on the cell phone is more distracting than talking to a passenger. Could have come out the other way. The researchers uh, weren't trying to state their opinion beforehand because this was a fairly new phenomenon when they did the study. Uh, and some people were saying, well, it's, 
it's distracting when you talk to the person next to you. Uh, so maybe it's similar to a cell phone. All I right, probably well, would have been one of those uh, three that ended up in the <laughs> <laughs> missing, even if I was with the passenger. <laughs> well, Curtis brings up a good point, right? Because some people are more naturally distracted by uh, stimuli, we'll say, whether it's people talking to them or other things. And so those kinds of people are probably going to forget to stop anyway. Mm -hmm. And then there are other drivers, maybe uh, not like Curtis or me, but other drivers who... <laughs> remember to do what they're supposed to do and don't get lost and stop at the rest area. Uh, and they would do that whether they were talking to the passenger in the simulator or on the cell phone. So what, what Curtis is going to be doing is sort of pretending that the specific treatment that the subjects got won't change whether or not they stop at this rest area, that it's more a product of that person's driving and their focus and that whether that person uh, was assigned to cell phone or to passenger, they would have resulted in the same decision about stopping at the rest area. It wouldn't have mattered for them. Right. So I'm going to throw it over to you, Curtis, because this uh, simulation is pretty cool. Yeah, this simulation is uh, is is pretty fun here. Um, I didn't do my job and get my That's all right. screen share up first. Here we go. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a pretty interesting one, and and I've actually done this done this with students with an actual um, you know video game in class. We brought it in and 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 did this, and we had somebody call them on the cell phone uh, and stand out in the hall and ask them questions, and then we had somebody else with the same set of questions sitting next to them and do this, and we had sort of a similar uh, setup in my classroom with this, and so this has been a fun one, and I'm really glad you chose this one uh to to look at this evening this is this is way cool so um what i, I want to kind of explain this one i will not go through um all of the the gory details of building this one um so much i won't type it out um but we'll visit all of the different uh all the different parts and pieces of this simulation and how um this one could be built um and so on the on the far left here in columns a and b I have our passenger uh, and cell phone uh, groups, and you'll notice um, that in these two columns, I have um, the exact results from the original simulation, from the original experiment, rather, um, where I have 20, uh, 21 yeses in the passenger uh, group, which means that they, they were able to um, make the stop they were supposed to, um, and three no's, and, and the... Uh, the 20, or sorry, the same 24 over here with 12 of them making this and and 12 of them not making it in the cell phone group, right? So this was, this was my original um, experiment. These were the results from the original experiment, all right? And that's going to be important as we look at page 1.2. Uh, what we've got here are the two original results, right? So we, we have uh, those guys ready to go. Right, next we have um, all of the drivers from the experiment. Um, so imagine that what we've done is we've taken those 24 people. They were our 24 people, or sorry, 48 people that we were going to use regardless, right? So we've got these guys here, we've got them um, pulled together. They were going to be assigned to one group or the other. All right, and as Darren alluded to earlier, um, there are some folks that uh, that would miss the would miss the the exit regardless of what you did to them, and there are others that would make the exit regardless of what you did to them, um, and we're going to assume that that's true for everyone. We're going to assume that that regardless of being assigned to the passenger group or to the cell phone group, that um, their ability to stop at that stop uh, at that rest stop was more or less predetermined. They were going to miss it or they were going to uh, make it regardless of the, of the treatment that they received. So what I have here in this list of drivers is, um, what does that make? 33 yeses and um, the remainder no's out of 48. So I have that population now 
um, that I'm going to use, that, that grouping that I'm going to use um, for my simulation. And I am going to reassign them repeatedly over and over and over again. I'm going to reassign them into the cell phone group and into the passenger group. And the question we're asking ourselves is, is there, uh, is there a high likelihood or, or, or a reasonable likelihood that, that this sort of distribution of the two um, groups could happen by random circumstance? Because what we're assuming is everybody had a predetermined outcome to begin with. And, and we're gonna check to see is, is that assumption a reasonable assumption um, that they had a, had a predetermined, predetermined outcome. Now, the way we're gonna do this is similar to the way that we handled the, the teens. We're going to come over here um, and we're going to look at uh, building a random sample from that, uh, from that list of drivers, from that, that group of 48 drivers. And we're gonna, self, we're gonna simulate grabbing 24 of them without replacement. That's why the one is here this time. So we're gonna sample without replacement and we're gonna assign those individual drivers into the group called cell phone. That's why I called it cell here. Now, many of you probably have a question. Uh, why is this word sim in here? What in the world does that have to do with anything? And um, as my friend Tom Dick likes to, to say, it's a tickler. Um, all it is, 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 is it's a, it, when that value changes, it forces me to recalculate. Um, that's why I have this on a notes page in a math box. It forces this statement to be recalculated. So I draw a new random sample every single time this value sim changes. And so I've got this slider that I inserted up here, a clicker, if you will, uh, for me to, to just generate new samples by changing the value of sim. It has nothing to do with the random sample itself. And it also doesn't have, I, I've messed it up, so it doesn't even count the number of times that I've done this sample. But what it does do is it says, hey, this value sim has changed, so you need to draw a new random sample. That's important for me because what I want to do is take this sample multiple times over and over again. And you guys can see as I'm clicking that value here, we're getting a new cell phone group every single time. And there's 24 values. There's 24 uh, people in that. And you can see them uh, occurring over here underneath of this, this list. Now, I've got those uh, cell phone people um, repeated over here um, in this group called cell. Um, they should be showing up. There they are. Uh, underneath of this, this group called cell phone here. So this group cell phone is a repeat of that cell sim. So it's just going to display every time that I do a new sample, it's going to display those guys here. Now, in, in essence, that's all I really have to do because once I've set, once I've sampled uh, the cell phone people, once I've got those people assigned to the cell phone group, everybody else is going to go to the passenger group. We know that, so we can do the we can do the two proportions and we can we can work it all out from there. But I was talking with Darren, and and one of the things I wanted to make sure that I was able to to display for you was this side-by-side -side sort of comparison between the cell phone group um, and the passenger group. I wanted to see that repeatedly over and over again. And so in order to get this, cell, this passenger group, I actually do need to know who ended up in that group as well. So the next part of this is a little bit fancy. Um, it, it is one way to get this to happen. I'm sure there are probably other creative ways to make this happen as well. So what I've done is I've taken the, uh, I've, I've, I've made a sequence. So a way to fill uh, a list with values is to generate a sequence. Um, and the sequence takes um, four entry, four arguments. The first one is the expression that you're gonna use. My expression here is, is actually a piecewise decision all right, so it's going to enter a no for all of the values uh, less up to less than or equal to the, the 15 that I'm going to possibly get here 
um, and 15 minus, I'm going to count every single one of those no's that end up in uh, the cell phone group. All right. So I'm going to take, there were, there were uh, a total of 15 no's, right? So the, the, the maximum number that could end up in here is 15. And then I'm going to subtract off every one of those that ended up in the, the cell phone group. And once I've taken all of those out, that's how many no's I'm going to have in the passenger group. And then the remainder of those will then be the yeses. And so that's how this, that's how I'm filling that, that sequence uh, uh, up with all of my no's and yeses. So that's why you see those in not really any random order. It just starts with no, 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 no. And then the remainder yeses. Then the next argument is, is X. So you can see why I used the X um, there, which is uh, how I'm gonna subtract the 15. Uh, and then from one to 24 is just how I fill, um, how I fill that sequence. So just um, showing how that passenger piece um, is built there. So then let's, let's look at this. We can actually take random samples, uh, repeated samples. And you notice I've taken a whole bunch of these samples. But each time that I do this, you're going to see uh, a comparison between the cell phone group and the passenger group uh, sort of repeated side by side. So I can see those two guys uh, and make some sort of a decision or at least know that what each one of my samples looked like. Now, the question that Darren asked was an interesting one. Uh, and these researchers asked, and that is, is one of these more distracting? They didn't say, is cell phones more distracting than passengers or is passenger more distracting than cell phone? They said, is it possible that one of them is more distracting? And that lends us to the idea that, that really we need to look at both ends of this distribution. I have chosen a direction. I've chosen to um, subtract the, uh, the cell phone people distracting um, from, the, the, uh, from the, the passenger people. So I'm gonna end up with this positive end up here that I'm kind of interested in, but it's possible that I could also be interested uh, in this other end down here and I need to make sure that I count both sides. Right, and so in the same fashion that I did before, I've built this P value where I'm counting uh, the number of times that I've taken a sample and I've counted the number of times that I have either exceeded a difference that is less than or equal to uh, negative uh, 0.375 or I've exceeded a value less than or, or greater than or equal to uh, positive 0.375, all right, my original, uh, my original comparison. So this is, uh, this is kind of what I ended up with in my, my count, and that's my p-value, my total um, p-value that I got from that, uh, from that simulation. So Darren, I think that kind of gives us that's great. an idea of what we should be expecting from the formal stuff. That's great. Uh, if you want to hand it back, I'll... Uh... All right. We good? You are good to go. All right. So uh, that was what uh, Curtis did, that beautiful simulation approach. Um, but you know me, I'm gonna show you like the unit six approach. Um, so if we're gonna do the formal approach, um, we're gonna state our hypotheses. The null hypothesis is no difference in the true proportions. Uh, the alternative is that there is a difference. And again, we have to define our parameters so P passenger would be the true proportion of drivers like the ones in the study. Remember they were volunteer college students who would stop at the rest area when talking to a passenger and P cell would be the true proportion of drivers like these who would stop at the rest area when talking on a cell phone. Our null hypothesis, which is the one Curtis simulated based on is that the treatment did not have any effect on these subjects. They were gonna either stop or not stop based on their own innate qualities and so the simulation was based on what sort of differences would you observe in the sample proportions if there was no treatment effect at all? And Curtis helped answer that question. Um, again, I'll state an alpha of 0.05 just since one wasn't stated in my question. Now here we want to use a two sample Z test for a difference in proportions. I put a question mark at the end, not because that's not what we want to use, but because we have a little issue that's going to come up here. 
Um, the randomness is fine. The researchers randomly assign the subjects into the two groups, so that allows for them to make an inference about cause and effect. It does not allow them to generalize to all drivers everywhere, unlike people uh, in the simulator, because the only people they used were undergraduate college students in Utah. So the generalization here is only to subjects like the, the ones in the study. So the next thing we need to check, um, there was no sampling involved in this problem, it was random assignment. So we need to check whether the normal approximation is okay. And we start out fine, 24 times uh, our combined proportion overall, uh, Curtis mentioned was 33 out of 48 that did stop. And then there were 15 that didn't. So we multiply that combined proportion times the sample size in each group. And we multiply that combined proportion times the, uh, sorry, the uh, 24 in each group times mm -hmm. the failure, uh, the overall failure rate. And that causes a problem. We get a value yeah. less than 10 which in a lot of the uh, textbooks uh, means you can't do this test. Some textbooks use five and that would allow you to go on. Uh, but if your textbook uses 10, you're kind of done now. And the same problem with the other group because the sample size is the same in both groups. Right. So by my way of thinking, uh, if you use 10, the conditions are not met and you're out of luck. So then I thought, well, maybe we could use a chi-square test I mean, mm, we have that's creative. two categorical variables here, type of distraction and whether or not you stop at the rest area. Maybe we could see if there's convincing evidence uh, of uh, an association between the type of distraction and whether or not people stop at the rest area. Well, we have the random assignment just fine. And for the chi-square test, you check the large counts condition um, by looking at the row total times the column total divided by the table total. And so I did that for each of the cells and those numbers um, all are at least five, which is the condition for the chi-square test. So for those of you who wonder like, why do books sometimes use five for the cutoff for a two proportion Z test? It's because it kind of parallels this five. Mm -hmm. And these two tests actually give you an equivalent result mathematically. So the books that use 10 are actually the ones being a little bit stricter um, on the two proportion Z test. So if you carry on with the chi-square test, uh, I got a p-value of 0 0.005. And just for fun, I went ahead and did the two proportion Z test, even though the conditions are not met. So I shouldn't be doing that. Shame, shame. And I got 0 0.005. It's the same p-value exactly. Yeah. And for those who don't know, the chi-square value is the square of the z-value here. Uh, that's kind of a fun little math, math stats fact. So it's exactly the same um, value for the probability. Now here's the rub. Neither of these is a very good estimate. So mm -hmm. you shouldn't be doing this test if you use 10 as your cutoff for n times p and n times 1 minus p you maybe should be doing this test because everybody uses five for the cutoff, but neither one of them gives a very good approximation. In that simulation approach, um, the result that Curtis got was much closer to 1%. Mm -hmm. uh, when we did a simulation earlier, we got like- uh, uh, Was it 0.9%, um, Yeah. 0.94%. So the value that you get from a traditional test isn't actually that close. The value that you get from a simulation if you run, especially if you run thousands and thousands of trials, is really close because that's what a two sample test for a randomized experiment actually should be doing. You should be checking all the different possible random assignments and seeing how often you end up with a difference that large or larger purely due to the random assignment, which is what Curtis did. Right. My approach is just a model to try to approximate that. And as you can see, it's not terribly it's not terribly good in this case because the conditions aren't quite met for the for the two proportion Z test. Yep. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, now, whatever p value you got, we'll say it was closer to 1%. It's still pretty small. So the data in this study did provide the first convincing evidence out there uh, that talking on a cell phone is in fact 
more distracting than talking to a passenger while driving. And you saw a lot of states in the 2000s start imposing laws uh, to make handheld cell phone use illegal uh, because of studies, most notably this one, but others like it uh, gave, gave very similar results. So I thought that was uh, kind of a cool one to share. Yeah, this is a really, that was a really, uh, really interesting one. And I really appreciate how the, um, how the results from the simulation uh, kind of get really close to what we, what we hope. Um, and this is one where it's really interesting for the students to also get an idea for, you know, there's this gray area that we have with these, uh, these conditions, right? We, we check these, the, we check these conditions and there's, they, they act kind of like there's these, um, hard and fast, if it's, you know, it's greater than 10, if I've got 11, I'm good to go. Um, and, and it's, it, we're, we're really kind of getting at it, especially with this one, kind of this idea that, well, really <laughs> you want to kind of get we're getting a gray area there and we're getting a decent approximation. And you said it really nicely that, that we're getting a model that we hope gets close to what the, what the real thing is. And, and in this case, um, re-randomizing is probably one of the best ways um, to show that, that p-value or to approximate that p-value, that probability. That's right. And I, I wanted to take um, a moment to deliver on my promise to this idea of um, putting together all the inference about categorical data, which is unit six flowing into unit eight on uh, chi-square. If people are tight on time this year, this actually would be something to consider. Like once you've taught all of unit six really well, confidence intervals and significance tests for one and for two proportions, then students should have a really good foundation, but you could continue on with the categorical data into unit eight and do the chi-square right after. Uh, I wouldn't normally recommend that in a typical year because you wanna give students an idea of what you do in terms of inference about uh, quantitative data for means one and two samples, but uh, it would be a potential streamline this year to do unit six and eight together. Uh, and then likewise, uh, what we're gonna do in our next session, do units seven and nine together, uh, right. inference about quantitative data first for means and then for slopes. I just, I know some people uh, have shared with me that they're, they're really just in unit five right now, whereas they might normally be all the way deep into unit six. Uh, right. So if you're looking for little ways to streamline just a bit, um, this unit six, eight combo might be, uh, might be one of those ideas. Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good idea. Um, it's a nice, it's a nice thought um, for this particular year anyway. Uh, on, okay, so my students are already kind of in this mode. I can, I can kind of help. I want to put one uh, little plug out here. We're getting close to time. First of all, if there's any questions, you guys certainly um, put those in the chat. If there's not, I want to put one plug out there, and that is for the bulletin board where we hide um, all of this information. We've got all of this posted up on the uh, education.ti.com bulletin board. Um, there's links to all of the YouTube live uh, events that we've had there. And then also the, the, the presentation. So Darren's uh, presentation that we've got here. Um, and if you have any questions or if you would like the TNS files that we used this evening, if you wanna use this with your students, that'd be awesome. I am more than happy uh, to email, uh, email those things to you. My chat, my email um, will pop up here in the chat um, shortly. Um, it's uh, curtis at ti.com. Um, so if you haven't if that uh, isn't on the, the chat real quick, you can write that down. It's Curtis, C-U-R-T-I-S at ti.com. You can certainly ask me questions uh, about the TNS files we used this evening. Uh, and with that, Darren, if you've got uh, anything else you want to show here? Uh, well, I think uh, I'm, I'm trying to show the uh, bulletin board just so people yep. can see uh, the presentation link is here. And then um, our, our final session uh, for the different CED units, uh, we've got scheduled for Monday, March 1st. Uh, where we're going to take a look at units seven and nine. That's right. And the link to uh, that session is right below that there. Click to, to join that upcoming session. And then all of the other ones are accessed from our YouTube channel. So uh, with that, Darren, I think we can uh, go ahead and sign off. Uh, sure enjoyed this evening and we'll look forward to, to seeing you next time. That was great. Thanks, Curtis. Good night.